marketing permits, especially for airborne particulate matter. This quarry data would make a good baseline measurement for further studies at the Route 40 plant when it's fully operational. We feel that an official request for a, these air quality studies from the state or the federal authorities by the Board of Select Persons would be fulfilled in a more timely manner than a citizen's initiated request. Would you please help us? Thank you for listening and Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you. So everybody else that would like to address the board? What do we do with that? I think the EPA, we, we get a hold of an EPA representative? Or? Yeah, we can, re we can reach out. We'll reach out and see if what data we can collect. I have a contact. As you may be aware or well know, Mr. Wojcik re frequently comes in about the trucks and the air quality on the uh, Oak Street property. So I've been in contact with the regional uh, manager for the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. So I'll reach out uh, with an email. Okay. Thank you. Seeing nobody else, that moves us to committee vacancies. Pat, would you mind? Sure. Uh, currently, there is uh, one vacancy on the Arts and Technology Education Fund Committee, uh, one vacancy on the CCA Advisory Committee, one vacancy on the Center Village Master Plan Implementation Committee, one vacancy on the Commission on Disabilities, two vacancies on the Community Action Program Committee, four vacancies on the Council <coughs> on Aging for Associate Members, um, the Cultural Council can cap have up to 21 members. There are several openings available. One, there's one opening on the Energy Conservation Committee, one opening on the Historic Commission, four openings on the Holiday Decorating Committee, two openings on the Middlesex Canal Commission. Uh, we still are looking for one uh, person to serve as the alternate member of the Neshoba Valley Technical High School Committee. Uh, the Parade Committee welcomes all applicants. There's one opening on the Permanent Building Committee, one opening on the Personnel Board, five openings on the Public Celebrations Committee, two openings on the Skate Park Committee, and one opening on the Tree Committee. If you're interested in serving on any of these committees, you can fill out an application online or at the Town Manager's Office. Thank you, Pat. We'll move on to licenses. We have a one-day uh, liquor license for Chelmsford Public Library. Is there anybody here from the library? It's the same one we do every year, right? Actually, this is one that they don't do, but the, the, this is the first time I remember them doing one like this, but we do have them at the library periodically. Yeah, from time to time. Yep. So I'll make a motion that we approve a one-day um, beer and wine license for the Chelmsford Library uh, for Saturday, January 11th, uh, from 2 to 4 p.m. Second. A motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 4 to 1. Um, 4 0. All right, presentations. Steve, you're up. Good evening, Chairman, uh, members of the board. Thank you for uh, giving us this time to talk about this uh, topic of safety. Um, what we've been doing from the safety perspective is um, um, focusing on a process that I've been using uh, for a good portion of my professional career. Um, 30% of my time when I worked at either the plant or the d divisional or the corporate level was for companies that had no safety programs. I had to start them off. And as a consultant, about 40% of my clients had no safety programs, so I had to work with them to develop theirs. And through that time, I developed the acronym about how I go about doing this at the various places that I've worked at. Um, and the acronym is RACE, and it involves four different particular and distinct areas. Relationship building, assessing current conditions, compliance programs, and elevating the risk mindset. Um, from the relationship perspective, uh, I feel that it's really important to go out and introduce myself, but more importantly to have relationships with people so they understand who I am and how I go about addressing situations that they'll bring to me because there's absolutely no way I could do my job without having someone um, give me information about stuff that's going on or something that might be going on or they have a concern with. Um, so this, uh, this summer, I went with uh, Brian Curley to every one of the schools. He invited me to join him. And from that situation of going through, learning about the schools, how uh, the, the situations that go on there, and taking a look at some situations, we found some safety hazards that we addressed through the school dudes. 
and through my relationship with Brian, they connected me up with the uh, folks at the CMT as well as the theater department, Tom Peterson and Craig Robertson. And they, have my, they invited me to come out and take a look at the pack. At the pack, we found some um, safety issues that we're now looking to address. In addition to looking at the safety issues with regard to the pack, they invited me to uh, look at the buildings that were set up for the show in Chicago. I'm not sure if you folks have saw that show, but it was a bigger set than what normally is out there. And uh, we worked with them to make sure that the set was safe for the children and um, make sure there was no issues, and we had no issues with regard to that program. Additionally, with regard to the introductions, Gary Perk said he um, invited me to sit in on his DPW meetings every week. So I got to know his department managers as well as the folks out there in the field uh, so they know me and they call me when, when there's an issue I need to deal with. Those are the interior people. The exterior people, one of them is Mark, uh, Mark J., whose last name I can't pronounce if you even help me with it. Uh, he works for Maya and Cabot Risk Management. There are insurance people. So a good relationship with the insurance person uh, is very important in a position of mine to ensure that the, um, the insurance company knows that we're trying to re reduce our risk because they're, the, uh, they're the eyes and the ears of the underwriter in the field. Uh, in addition to that, um, I developed a good relationship with the folks who are doing the roofing out here on Town Hall. I meet with them every morning to determine what they're doing, what safety protocols are in place, and um, anything that comes up during the day, they give me a call to, to, to ask me to help them address. In addition, we had the AT&T contractor up here putting antennas up on the, on the roof. Again, met with them every morning, learned about what they were doing, and worked them through um, their process too. The second part of race is assessing the conditions. Um, I've been to every building, um, every school, every park. I toured the rail trail, um, went to the forum, and uh, so I could identify. And when people say, hey, have you, have you ever been to South Row School? There's a problem here. I can at least um, identify where, how to get there and uh, what I've seen and what I know about the school. Um, in this initial walkthrough of all the, school, uh, all the locations, um, I identified that we have AEDs on site. And uh, during that process, in trying to locate them all and see what status they were, and we found some that were not fully functional. And from the risk perspective, that's not a good situation to be in. So working with Joyce Cote at the DPW and Chief Ryan, we got all the AEDs up in to working compliance order. And I'm now working with the Department of Health to put together um, AED slash CPR training so that we have at least two people in each of the various buildings uh, properly trained on the use of those AEDs. Uh, the other part about assessing is observing work in progress. So for example, one of the things I particularly looked at was how they were installing the light poles at the uh, school this summer and wiring them up, as well as the sprinkler systems that they were installing, as well as work zone safety. Um, taking a look at our employees who are working on the roads, plowing, sanding, the crossing guards, anyone who's out there in the road where there's a risk of them getting injured. It was funny, the other morning I was driving to work on 495 and the right lane is closed and like pretty much everybody um, go like, you know, what the heck's going on here? I pull up, there's a state police truck, a state police car, and then our fire truck blocking the front first right hand lane. As I get around the fire truck, I notice that our crew's out there working with the folks that, who were in the car. Afterwards, I went to the police department. I stopped in. I said, hey, I just want to say thank you very much. That was great that you were using the truck to block that right lane to give our guys a little bit more space to work. And uh, they said they did a lot of training on that, and they were very happy that I was um, noticing that. Um, in addition to assessing the work conditions, I also look at the, I do accident investigations on all the accidents that come in to identify the root cause and, more importantly, to identify a scenario where uh, it doesn't happen again, to try to, try to re eliminate the uh, action from recurring. The C in race stands for compliance, and obviously you know that OSHA is now mandating stuff over here in, uh, on the, in the public sector. And so there's physical conditions that involve machine guarding, uh, fire equipment systems, for example, like the extinguishing systems in the cafeteria uh, over the uh, heated hoods. Um, and um, one of the process of taking a look at the physical conditions, Chief Ryan and I walked through all 
uh, with Mark J of the insurance carrier. We went through all of the fire departments and uh, identified issues from the safety compliance perspective. We've submitted uh, work requests to have those completed uh, as part of our process to uh, make it safer in the fire houses. Under Ocean Compliance, there's about 20 programs that require written programs, uh, identify the needs where we have the needs for those programs. Uh, the interesting thing, municipalities versus a regular company, you could write one program that would cover the company um, in the municipalities. For example, the bloodborne pathogen policy for the police and the fire and the sewer department can't be wrote as one, so I've got to write three to cover those, um, um, our, those requirements. In addition to written program, compliance also has to do with training of our employees. So all those 20 programs involve some aspect of training to all of our employees. Some of the training is already completed. Um, some still needs to be done. We have record keeping as part of compliance, the OSHA log, as well as any training records or um, training having to do with any kind of testing that we do with regard to uh, the equipment, the fire extinguishers, all that has to be documented. And finally, E stands for elevating the risk. To me, that's the most important part. I believe that safety is not the lack of accidents, but safety is a cohesive program in place to identify and eliminate the risk that you can and to control and minimize the risk that you can't totally control. And with that, do you have any questions? You mentioned accidents. How, like, how many have we had to investigate in the last year? Since I've been on in Jul uh, since July, it's been I think about nine that we've recorded to Ma that we've reported to Maya. And would would you classify them as minor or <laughs> mild or? Um, um, there was only one that I recall that had um, uh, lost time. Mm -hmm. And I'm, we're, we're talking not about the fire in the, in the police service oh, okay. um, from the, for the rest of the town. There was one that had, mo that had um, lost time and the rest were just medical only. And you also mentioned the written programs that you're working on? Yes. How, how many of those are, do we have to do to become OSHA compliant? Uh, at, at probably 35. So there's still 35 to go? Uh, yes. I just wonder okay, if yeah. trying to just get, get it's, my it's, it's actually, head around the order of it's magnitude. It's actually quite, of, it's quite a big job. And are, have you been able to complete some? Yeah, we've complete, we on? completed the ones on um, uh, bloodborne pathogens for the fire department, for the police department, and I'm working on the ones for the schools. Mm -hmm. um, the excavation one I did for the DPW because that's an area of concern for me because anytime anybody's going down in a hole somewhere, yep. it's kind of an issue for me. Um, and I'm working right now on the emergency evacuation plans. Uh, the schools have some. I looked at the ones that they had written. I'm writing one here for Town Hall right now. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you for the update. Uh, if you ever have any questions, feel free to get a hold of me. I'll be more than happy to answer them for you. <clears throat> Welcome, Jennifer. Good evening, everyone. Just to identify myself, I'm General Lanson, Community Services Coordinator. Happy to be here tonight. Hope you all had good holidays. Um, <clears throat> so you should all have a handout in front of you um, that'll kind of give you a little overview of what the last six months has looked like for me in my position. Um, interestingly enough, um, in the first six months, I'm going to start with something that I actually didn't put on the handout, um, which is actually probably the most important thing that um, that I've been doing, but something that is just so second nature to me that I slipped my mind to even put it on the paper, and that would be community outreach. So obviously, first thing right off the bat um, when I came in here was was uh, looking to begin to outreach within the community, um, both within town entities that already exist um, and community stakeholders that exist in the whole greater Lowell area, but with the actual residents residents of the town as well. So, um, you know, one of the first things I did was I established some weekly drop-in hours so that residents can feel free to come into the town offices here and meet with me. Those are um, Tuesday evenings from 4 to 6 p.m. and Thursday mornings from 9 to 11 p.m. 
uh, 11 a.m. Sorry. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> also, anybody is is always welcome to contact me and um, make an appointment at any time that fits better into their schedule. I've also been doing some monthly Saturday um, drop-in hours at the library to give folks um, a chance to be able to see me on a Saturday if that's more convenient for them and also in a different place. Um, and I've actually had more bites on the Saturdays at the library than I have had here weekly at Town Hall. So um, I'll continue that in, into this new year. It seems um, to be a good thing going. So. Um, some of the other things I've done is is I've gone to some of the various other committees and, and met with them and presented myself like at the school committee and at the Special Education Parents Advisory Council through the schools. I've gone to the police department roll calls um, and to the senior center. Um, and then some of the more unique things that I've been doing is um, I've been volunteering at Table of Plenty, um, which is our community supper here in town. Um, at least once a month I've been going there, and that's really a great way for me to get myself out there and to meet residents within the community um, and hopefully you know, let them know that I'm approachable and, and open to hearing from them. Um, and another thing that I've been doing is I've been trying to reach out to some of the more um, private senior living centers like Summer Place, and I've been doing a monthly um, thing there at Summer Place and outreaching and meeting with residents that live there as well. Um, some of the some of the places where it's just maybe a little bit more difficult for people to come to me here at Town Hall than I will go to them. So um, I mentioned some of the connections I've established with some of the other town entities and community stakeholders. Um, like the faith-based community with the Chelmsford Clergy Group, um, and then there also is a, a Greater Lowell um, Clergy Group that I've been meeting with. Um, CTI Community Teamwork um, and the Lowell Transitional Living Center obviously are two big contacts um, for me because those are those are um, sort of services that we don't have directly here in Chelmsford that I would be referring folks to um, into Lowell. I joined the uh, Middlesex County DA's Lowell region opioid task force and I've joined a number of the Greater Lowell Health Alliance task forces, namely the mental health, the social determinants of health, and the substance use prevention task forces. Um, I A big thing, a real important need um, that I identified right off the bat was the need for me to be able to document my work. Um, and so um, it's important that the way that I document work electronically um, that it be password protected and encrypted and HIPAA compliant. Um, so I spent a little time trialing some different software packages and finally settled on one that, that I like and that will be able to allow me to pull some data at the end of the year to be able to present, which I think will be helpful. Um, so I've had that up and running for a few months. I was able to attend um, four different educational conferences and symposiums so far, um, all of which, all but one of which have been either free or um, paid for by grant funding. Um, so I've been very fortunate in that area. Um, and I also was able to get um, trained through community teamwork in Lowell to process fuel assistance applications with residents here in town. So that's kind of a big deal because um, if there's somebody at the senior center that can do that, but if you're not a senior, you would have to actually go to Lowell physically and meet with somebody at CTI to do that. And for some folks, that can be a real barrier. So this way, um, people can come in and they can meet with me, and I've processed a number of applications already. Um, and also, I will go to meet people at their homes or in some other place um, if they have difficulty getting to me here. So. <clears throat> just um, some of the areas of service you can see that I've been um, dealing with in the last six months is um, alcohol and substance use a little bit, but um, the majority of that stuff actually goes through the police department through their clinician with the jail diversion program. And I've been working very closely um, with that program and which was actually um, recently uh, that grant was extended and expanded. So that's um, pretty exciting. And so we kind of work collaboratively together on um, alcohol and substance use um, related issues with residents. Um, also providing help to people on mental health services and really trying to get the word out more strongly about the interface referral service that the town contracts for. Um, I found that a lot of um, people just don't know about it, have never heard about it. And so I've been doing a lot to try to increase awareness of that. Um, transportation is a, is a pretty big issue for folks if you're not a senior or you don't have a medical need to have a ride. So um, that's something that I've been working in conjunction with some of the Lowell entities and I'm um, actually just recently learned about a new provider for seniors that will give rides um, outside of a medical reason. So that's, um, that's helpful. Um, housing and homelessness, you're probably aware that 
<clears throat> there's been a lot of talk on the social media pages lately about homelessness um, within Chelmsford. And it's a little bit of a delicate subject because so many people really, really want to reach out and to help, but there's sort of a right way and a not so right way to do things. And so hopefully I've been, um, you know, helping folks navigate and, and uh, moderate that area. Um, and I also was able to join forces with um, a local resident who has been doing work in this area, her family, for many, many, many years um, and was able to help get a really large collection of donation donations of items um, for a community supper that was held um, just last week in Lowell. And a lot of those items went to a lot of our um, Chelmsford's homeless population. And it was just a, it was a terrific drive. And I was so enthused and impressed by um, this community and how much people really wanted to help and how much was donated. Um, and so there's a, there's a way, hopefully, that I will be expanding that in the future um, because I want this to not just be a holiday thing. Um, other areas that where I've been helping folks is, is applying for fuel assistance, um, troubles with utilities. So I had a, a, a situation pretty early on where a resident approached me because she had had her gas turned off through National Grid and she was disabled and she didn't realize that um, she qualified for a no shutoff if she had a physician letter. And so I was able to assist her with getting her gas turned back on and getting the necessary documentation needed in order to be able to um, to prevent her gas from being shut off again. So it's so many services are available to folks that they just don't know about. And so um, I'm happy to, to be able to get alerted to these situations and step in and help when I can. Um, some other areas you can see there, fin financial and legal services, referring folks out to services for that, um, referring folks um, for help with domestic violence issues, especially to like a domestic violence advocate through the courts in Lowell, grief support, and then um, household goods. I'm actually going in a couple of weeks with uh, two new residents of the community that have like next to no furniture to act in household goods. Um, you need to have a referral from a case manager in order to be to go there, but they will furnish your apartment, your entire apartment for free, all through donated goods. So um, you can see on the left side some of the referrals where I'm getting them from, obviously, police and fire, public schools I've been starting to work very closely with, um, and the Housing Authority has been terrific in working with me as well. Um, some referrals have come in through the Water District. Most of you know my connection there. Um, the library's been great, and the Senior Center have been great in working with me. And then every single town office in this building, the Board of Health, the Tax Collector, Veteran Services, the Town Manager's Office, everybody has been terrific, both in sending folks my way, but also in helping me learn my way around both the building and the community, since Chelmsford is new to me. So what comes next? Um, interestingly, in this fall, the Greater Little Health Alliance released the results of their community health needs assessment, which they conduct every three years. And they release them um, to the public in a very large bound volume that gives you all of the results for the entire Greater Little area. But after that was released, I was able to get our Chelmsford specific was results, which was very um, useful and helpful to me. And the two um, most identified areas um, of top priorities among Chelmsford, Chelmsford residents. So these are areas that Chelmsford residents themselves identified as top priorities because they're the ones that took this survey were mental health and access to healthy foods. So it makes sense to me that those are two areas that I need to really focus on in the future and figure out how to um, connect more folks to mental health services as needed, but also how to increase access to healthy foods. And I do have a little something in the works to address that. I don't want to tip my hand too soon, and, and so just stay tuned for that. Um, and then lastly, two other things I have coming up is um, I'm going to beginning beginning a um, a blog that I'm calling Community Crusaders, and the purpose of this blog is to highlight lesser known services and individuals that are doing really important community service work right here in Chelmsford. So I think a lot of people know about the big services like the CTI and you know things like that, but they don't know about the smaller services and the individuals who are doing things on a daily basis. So I want to bring attention to those lesser known services, but also hopefully bring in some more um, you know, folks that are willing to jump on board and help with those initiatives as well. 
And then the second thing that I'm looking at doing very, very soon is I'm going to be establishing a program that I'm calling Chelmsford Cares. And this is going to be a program to connect residents in need with residents that want help, uh, that want to help. And um, that came about because just a few weeks ago, um, probably mid-December, I was contacted by a resident um, who was wanting to sort of adopt a family for Christmas. And um, I had this um, couple in mind, um, the couple that I mentioned who had just moved, who recently moved to the community that have very little furniture. Um, and, and they have a very um, extensive background story story, but I fe just felt that they were really in tremendous need. And so I was able to connect that resident that reached out who wanted to connect with somebody with this couple. And the resident provided this couple with everything for Christmas from a Christmas tree with a stand, lights, decorations. Um, the couple provided me with a wish list um, of really basic necessities that they needed, like boots and pajamas and blankets and things like that. And then the, couple, the, the residents also provided to the couple um, foods that they're not able to access from the food pantries. So things like fresh produce and meats and, and things like that. They even cooked some meals for them, um, pre-cooked, that could be heated up um, for holiday meals. So it was the couple agreed to, be, to actually meet the residents face-to-face and it was just an unbelievable day of connecting these two groups of people together and seeing how, you know, two folks wanted to help out two other folks. And and, and the couple who who's new to town um, described that this was their first Christmas in 10 years. So I think that there's a, a real way that, that members of the community who want to and who are able can make direct impacts on those members of the community who are in need. And my goal with this Chumps for Cares program is to connect those two groups. So I just want to finish by saying that, you know, I, this is a, in addition to a brand new position for the town, this was a totally new position for me in life as well. Um, and I've learned a tremendous amount in the last six months. And I consider myself to be a lifelong learner. I'm always learning. Um, and I appreciate the guidance that I've gotten from, you know, entities like the Board of Health and also a few of um, members of the board here have reached out to me um, and, and helped me along with some things. So I'm hugely appreciative of that. I like to think that um, as I learn more, I'm able to do more. Um, and so just thank you for the opportunity to be serving the community of Chelmsford. Does anybody have any questions? How many have you reached? Sorry. How many individuals? How can you be reached? How can I be reached? Um, so I have an email address, jmelanson mm -hmm. at townofchelmsford.us. Um, I have a phone number, 978-770-7687. Yep, okay. that's a cell phone number that does not get shut <coughs> off. So okay. I check it on the weekends. Thank you. So, Jim, um, yes. one, one thought as you were speaking, you know, about the person who helped donate all the food mm -hmm. in Lowell. Um, I get a lot of questions from people saying, um, you know, I have an old bedroom set. How, I don't know where to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Or I have, um, you know, a basement full of baby clothes or toys. Or is there somewhere in town we can bring that? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you're doing this or maybe in the recycling brochure that goes out every yeah. six months, you could put a list of other places to get rid of or sure. donate. Sure, um, that's a terrific I, I know, idea. Like the acting goods. Yep. You know, I know you can donate furniture there, but it's getting it there yes. for a lot of people is hard. Right. Um, but maybe if, if there was a way to connect to someone who does a pickup program or a list of high need items yeah. um, that you could donate. Um, yeah, that's a terrific idea. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Sure. Any other questions? Thank, no. you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Good night. All right, item seven, transfer of real property. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I did uh, have a formal action for the board this evening regarding a, a small parcel of land on Acton Road. Um, it's shown on the map there on the screen. Uh, this, this, this parcel um, is, was recently acquired in the collector's office by foreclosure, um, and it, it obviously has a minimal value um, because of its limited size. Uh, and, and, and location. 
the um, in fact, you can see the unpaid property taxes, interest, and fees only total, total less than nineteen hundred dollars. Um, and so this fifty five hundred sixty nine square foot parcel again has minimal assessed value. Um, and why we bring it to the board is is that the parcel there immediately abuts the conservation land parcel um, significantly behind it uh, that runs in that area. Um, so upon receiving this information from the finance director uh, on December 19th, I reached out to the Conservation Commission. Um, the Conservation Commission met and they, they unanimously voted to accept the parcel for conservation purposes. Um, so what needs to take place at this point in time would be for the board uh, to take a formal vote to transfer parcel 102-357-17 um, to the Conservation Commission for conservation purposes. And again, it provides frontage uh, for existing front, uh, additional frontage for existing conservation land on Acton Road. Paul, a little more history on this. Chelmsford Children's <laughs> School, Inc., who owned it? Yes. How did they, and what did they do with that piece of land? It was, it I, I, uh, I don't know how much publicly, I, I, there's a little more detail to it. I don't know how, this is something that was a deliberate foreclosure. Um, the parcel was held by an entity, a corporate entity. Uh, the purpose no longer exists or existed, um, and, there, and it was unclear title. And so when I was reached out by by the, the gentleman uh, dealing with the matter, the approach was to let it go to foreclosure, and by going through the tax foreclosure, it would, it would expunge any claims on title and then allow the parcel to um, then be conveyed to the town um, in sort of this limited man I don't know if you want to add anything to that Michael and but but that is that is sort of what what acquired here um, you know again where it's it, it's 5400 square feet um, that was sort of you know it, obviously there was no sense of continuing to pay taxes on it um, so that's sort of this sort of completes what really has been a, a multi-year journey um, and was know, it ever attached to a different parcel it, it was there was some it was never attached to the parcel of the conservation land to it there were some questions in, in clouding the title uh, and and I, I I can let you know offline I just don't want to I don't I want to name the person Got online it. just because trying to be respectful in terms uh, okay. of how that was done so it's the 102357-9 is conservation land yes yes that's, that's a huge a huge lot above it huge yeah. lot above it of conservation property um, so again, this just adds frontage along Acton Road, yeah. um, which again you you won't even know because it's already there. It's sitting vacant, but it but it just sort of cleans up the title and cleans up the the ownership of the property. Okay, I make a motion that we approve the transfer of the uh, parcel identified as one hundred two dash three five seven dash seventeen formerly owned by the Chelmsford Children's School to the Conservation Commission for Conservation Purposes. Second. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. Four zero. Thank you, Paul. So that brings us to the Mass Municipal Association resolutions. This is for the MMA meeting, correct? The, yes. Yeah, it's coming up in, three, in two and a half weeks. Oh, you want me to make the motion on this one? Or? This is where we have to, we have to uh, assign a vote. Yeah. Well, we have to say how we're going to vote on them too. Yep. We will discuss each one. Okay. So we can discuss all three together. Well, you usually get, you usually do it, so I was going to. I don't think mm. you wanted to. Uh, okay, I appreciate that. I mean, I don't have a problem with any three, any of them. So. Yeah, the first one is kind of a standard one about the uh, the partnership between the cities, towns, and and the state, um, the, and then the other two have to do with transportation. They seem to kind of say the same, both of the same, same right. thing. I mean, there's definitely a transportation issue in the state, so. Not just this state. <laughs> <laughs> Virginia, do you have any questions? No, I'm awesome. okay. 
Do you want me to make a motion that we appoint uh, what we like to Pat Wojcic to yeah, just to be represent, I, I, represent us and vote for? I don't know if I'm going yet, but uh, we, we can appoint Pat, and then even if I go, she can still vote. Okay, that makes it. Yeah, that that works. Right, so, so you can, have to start all so over you again. Yeah, you got to start all over again, George. <laughs> Jeez. I'll interrupt you one more time. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll make a motion that we uh, nominate Pat to uh, make the, uh, the votes for us at the uh, MM uh, convention next this month, later on this month. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Is that all right, uh, Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Are we good? All three at once. All right, and that brings us, Paul, to your town yeah, manager's Just reports. a br brief report uh, coming out of the holiday uh, break. Uh, it's just an update on Ledge Road, and I'm going to turn the microphone over to Michael McCall, who's been directly handling this matter. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. So uh, this was brought about, we had a few calls during the holiday break, and I did speak with the chairman offline who had indicated possible give an overview of what we've been doing and what we're currently doing on Ledge Road. And so this, this goes back almost two and a half years when the quarries were first required. At that time, I started performing regular uh, traffic monitoring about every six months, the beginning and ending, and during the uh, high construction season so that we could get a historical perspective of the trucks going down that road and recognize any patterns. And since the quarries have come online for the gravel production, we have seen a substantial increase, and that's been noted by many of the residents who've contacted the board, um, as well as our office complaining about the trucks. So um, in addition to the traffic input session, since this has started, what the first and most obvious thing we tried to pursue was to try and get a restriction for the heavy commercial vehicles going down Ledge Road. Um, and this will tie in a little bit. I'll, I'll talk about Miss um, Bowman's letter that she provided to the board last week. Although the Traffic and Safety Committee hasn't met, I did do a little <coughs> research on that area. But what the information Ms. Bowman provided about what Cambridge is doing and what we've been trying to do is to see w if there is any way possible that we could restrict the flow of the heavy trucks coming down that road. In order to do that, and I, I put it up on the uh, screen a few times in the past, we have to satisfy the conditions under the Massachusetts Uniform um, uh, Transportation Manual. And there's a specific section for heavy commercial vehicle exceptions. Um, we have to have a minimum of 5% heavy truck uh, vehicle traffic, and we have more than that. Um, and there, we also have to have a few other items which we do meet. Um, it could be a hazard to the road or the, the type of neighborhood. But above all, you have to have a viable alternative route. And the difficulty with our situation is ledge road is one way in, one way out. Um, moreover, uh, it is perpendicular to Dunstable Road, which if you were to go north, you run into Tingsboro and Westford. If you go south, you come right out into Vinyl Square. I proposed both of those alternatives um, in conversation with uh, MassDOT, and they were not inclined to direct the heavy trucks into Vinyl Square, given the, the, the tight business environment we have there, all the streets converging and the, the crosswalks. Um, but more importantly, if we wanted to turn them north towards exit 34, we would have to get the cooperation of the abutting communities. We did reach out to the communities at that time and ask them to bring that back to their respective boards, and to date we have not received a positive response from either of those communities, which would allow us to direct the trucks north and have a truck exclusion. How but long if they went on their own? That, like? They can go on their own, but we can't mandate it. No, I'm, not, I'm saying what happens if they go on their own, it has nothing to do with us, Correct. right? Mm -hmm. But we can't force them to go north. Yeah, you can make it uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Right. How, so, how long ago was that, Mike? Um, that we, probably o o 18 months ago, the previous we, summer. Do we know if they even brought it up yes. within their towns? Yes. Well, through informal channels, we know, yes. <coughs> okay. um, now, the question becomes, and, and I, you know, how to make it uncomfortable. Um, you know, we've looked at a variety of different things. Um, We've looked at whether or not we could put sidewalks or narrowing of the road. Um, 
assistant DPW director Steve Yonley looked into that for us. Um, and we came back with a cost of $200,000 for sidewalks on Ledge Road, over 340000 for Dunstable Road. But the problem, again, is Dunstable Road weaves in and out of another town. We can't put sidewalks and improvements on land that doesn't belong to us. So we wouldn't have a contiguous set of sidewalks going all the way from Lens, uh, Ledge Road down to Dunshire Drive. Not only that, there would be takings, um, appraisals, design fees that would go along with that. Similarly, we looked at widening or reconfiguring the intersection of Ledge and Dunstable Road. Um, our DPW and engineering at the time could not do it. They got an estimate from an outside design firm to, uh, to get that performed, and that would be $135,000 for the design fees alone. I had already spoken with National Grid, and they were willing to move the telephone poles, but they won't do that until we make a commitment with our design fee. Moreover, even if we narrowed the road or reconfigured the end of Ledge Road at Dunstable, that still doesn't guarantee the trucks won't continue to turn right. And we looked at that. Um, We've also done significant enforcement. We've had uh, complaints over the years of overloaded trucks, speeding trucks. Um, as you may recall, Chief Spinney, I worked with him. He deployed over 50 dedicated deployments this summer. We also brought in the state police truck team. And out of the Chelmsford police uh, deployments, they stopped almost 400 vehicles and only issued three citations to commercial vehicles, and they were minor infractions, not dealing with speed or weight violations. Similarly, the state police truck team did not encounter an awful lot of um, <coughs> violations. Most recently, I reached out to DOT with regard to what is called a limited heavy commercial vehicle exclusion, specifically looking at uh, excluding trucks from Ledge Road during the hours of operation when the school buses would be on that road. The initial response was, there is precedent, and you can do that. However, when we got down to the next layer, you still need a viable alternative route. So it all comes back to the Uniform Manual and Traffic Control Devices, which is a federal document adopted by the states, which the towns are required to adhere to, we cannot stop commercial trucks unless we can route them a different way. And at this point in time, there is no other way for them to get up Ledge Road. Um, the, the direction we're looking at right now, um, when, we, when we started talking about reconfiguring the um, intersection at Ledge Road was what if we had a, a essentially a cul-de-sac or a hammerhead so the buses could turn around and go all the way down Ledge Road. Um, right now, that looks like a, a, a potential um, that we can do. Uh, DPW has estimated that that would take cost approximately $60,000. However, we cannot initiate that till we get to Springtown meeting because we're going to have to look at getting the easements, the acquisitions, um, to make that happen. And is that ready to go to town meeting? It, it will be on the final warrant. You'll see it on the draft warrant, and, and it will be included on the final warrant we present to you at the end of February. How many easements would you need? I, I don't have that information at this time. I, I know they're looking at it. They're looking at the design of how they'll do it. It will be up around the end of, uh, I think, Oak Knoll. Oak Knoll. I can't remember that. So for anybody watching at home, the, the thought process behind that is that they would build a, a bus turnaround at the very end of Ledge, Oak Knoll, um, and that would at least help with the children that have to come down Ledge to get the bus at the end of Ledge and the dangers that are there. On top of the fact that you then would have a bus going down the street, stopping several times on the way in and s rolling slowly on the way out, um, but more importantly, keeping the kids safe. Oak Knoll is a public road, isn't it? That's Oak Hill Road, isn't it? Yeah, Oak Hill. Um, I may have had it confused with the other. I think um, it's Oak Hill Road. Yep. It goes, I think it is. But too. we, the. It's a, it's a public road. I, I know there's wetland in there. It's a problem, but. Like it, at the beginning, isn't there an easement on, or a, you know, like a 25-foot buffer on each side of the road? Uh, it, it, I, I can't speak to that. I, I talked to Attorney Haverty about coming in because, it, as you may recall, we talked to him about looking at some of our what potential legal options as well as the easements down there. He had indicated he could not be here this evening, but he said he would make a uh, point of being here for the 27th, for our meeting at the 27th. So he, he could provide us an update on those types of issues. And we'd have an idea from the DPW what the, what they would pro 
what they think that would yeah, be they the have, they have they have the area identified where they would That's do the turnaround. I mean. Yes, it would that, be at we, the end of the. Might only be have to talk to a couple of people. Yeah, at the end of the right of way or the public way because it ends right up there, right around Gilmet's property. So, and I mentioned um, the information that Ms. Bowman provided at the last meeting that talks about how Cambridge went about trying to deal with the truck problem as well. And I, my family lived in Cambridge for quite a long time, and I actually lived there as a young man. And I, I'm familiar with several of the streets that were included on their lists. Um, Cambridge, if you read their website and get into it, it, it all boils down to that manual and uniform traffic control devices. You can have preferred truck routes, but that's what it is. It's a preferred truck route. It's not a restriction. You can encourage trucks to use the preferred truck route, and most of their preferred truck routes are the numbered routes 2 to A, and they have about 40 streets that are pro, uh, set up to exclude commercial vehicles, and they did that over a process of 50 years. If you look, right. they didn't get them all in one batch. So uh, little by little, they accumulated those uh, heavy commercial vehicle exclusions. So the truck road is a, is, a, is a series of exclusions that were cobbled together to sort of right. guide trucks through a certain area. But it's not something that we could implement in one felt swoop and, uh, you know, get a multitude of exclusions um, and try and direct trucks. But we could do it over a course of time. We could put up signage saying a preferred route, but we would want to sit down and and work with folks to try and develop that preferred route. And we can go that route here if you want the, the Traffic and Safety Committee to start looking at what would be preferred routes. But right now, most of the trucks are using those routes that I'm aware of. But even when you get that heavy commercial vehicle exception, you can't limit deliveries, you can't limit uh, or preclude vehicles that are doing business or have their business on a particular road from using that way. Um, so that that's going to be the frustrating point. Even if we're able to get them in certain areas, the, the trucks still have to get their deliveries, and they still have to be able to enter their place of business. So well, I, I'd be happy if you started immediately working on a preferred truck route up there. If even on, if it on a preferred truck route, do you need the permission of the uh, abutting communities? Um, I'll have to look how they want to do. You can put signage when we were looking at. Um, the heavy commercial vehicle exceptions over in East Chelmsford around the Forum, uh, we were encouraged to develop a, a preferred truck route using the numbered routes 3A and 129. <coughs> um, so I will follow up on that. That's a good question whether or not it has to consist primarily of roads that are contiguous in the town or numbered routes. So I, I will follow up on that one. When you say you were encouraged, who was encouraging you? Mass DOT. Because initially we were uh, meeting with some resistance on getting those uh, streets, Carlton and Sprague, getting the uh, commercial vehicle, <coughs> heavy commercial vehicle exclusions. Um, the situation changed. Um, the traffic increased based on some developments in Bill Ricker, which satisfied the criteria that allowed us to get the exclusion. But before we satisfied everything over there, um, they were suggesting to us that we establish the preferred truck routes. And we already knew, due to ways and other things, that that wasn't working because people were just cutting through those side streets. One of the big problems up there, Mike, I'm sure you're getting the same phone calls I get, you know, and you probably get them too, uh, um, is there's a lot of, you know, uh, maybe maybe somebody's overloading, and mm -hmm. so when they're making the turns, they're spilling it all over the place. And a few times the DPWs had to go up there and just, Clean up all Street of the sweep and right from yes. the yep. get go all the way to probably to the highway, whatever. Yeah, I'm aware of two incidents probably in the last six months or so, um, and I've been alerted right away by one of the residents, and I've turned contacted DPW and the foreman right away, and they, I they agree. They they've do got that right out there and taken care of it. I mean, they shouldn't have to do that. I've sent letters to the four operators up there in the past. And I've called them, um, not in the most recent one, but I have sent them letters in the past. And the, again, sometimes the problem is identifying who the individual was because the response I received when I spoke to most of the um, managers on duty was, not me, must have been one of the other guys. Well, I mean, if you know, in some of them legitimately, like the LeMessures, they don't deal in gravel. Oh, yeah. It's, it, you know, so it really comes down to probably one or two of the others that There's are There's only mm -hmm. probably two. Right. And 
I mean, I, all you have to do is go right to the scale, and you can see the stuff starts coming off right at the scale, and it just continues. The so. difficulty, that's on the other side of the town line. So. Well, I guess. But, Mike, you know, you said that we've had two spills in six months you're aware of, and then you said you sent letters in the past, not this time, but previously. So you, you sent letters the first time. Yep. So we sent letters once. Um, but we, from what I understand, we, we have pictures of the truck that was dumping. Yes, I no? Don't, I don't have that, that information. Well, I went up there that day. I mean, there was no doubt where it came from. Matter of fact, there was only one open that day. The, one, the, the bad one, the real bad one that went all the way right up to Route 3, from the, right from the scale all the way. And it made a... And I, I, know, I think you went up. You may have gone up and you may no, have... I was actually uh, on vacation when this happened, no, so I no. answered and took care of the call. This was way back. This was when maybe oh, the, oh, the, the first original time bad you and I both there. went up there, yes. So, you know, I mean, it's too bad, that, you know, we, the DPW has got enough work to be doing. And, and you know, that's dangerous, and, and somebody's going to lose their tires. You know, you know it's some, it could be a projectile, too, if somebody goes over one and it flies it, hit a kid. <coughs> so so it just, I mean, I think maybe can we increase the, f the fine for overloading or anything like that? Can we? Do, is that something uh, we have control? Well, they're not loading in Chelmsford. So you can and, and, you and, and catch them I, I guess how do we oh. catch them? Because we had the state police. We have to have a truck team out there with portable scales to do that, and we tried to do that already once this year. With yeah, the they couldn't set it up because they didn't have enough room, right? right? They, so that's that's. So, I mean, the they difficult. don't really know if they were overloaded or they weren't overloaded, right? You'd have to ask them to do it probably right as they come off the scale or something. I mean, but then of course if they knew they were there, they're gonna not load it up. So I know it's a difficult situation, but it is a you know, it could be dangerous if it isn't, you know. And I'm not trying to hurt anybody. I mean, business is business, but I don't want to see the kids get hurt or the, or the neighborhood to be messed up all the time. I mean, that, that turn at Swain Road is always yep. full of stone. And, and I mean, it's not, I'm not, it's not your fault. I'm not. Well, I'm, the, I'm the, the issue is we have, we're, I don't see that we have a whole lot of options, and, and I guess that's what we have to talk to Attorney Haverty about because we, we have <laughs> tried all the various options and variations on those themes so with Mass DOT, and they've they've come back several times and said that, that it's not without the viable alternative route, we're not going to be able to exclude. So then, the question is, how, how do you catch them if you think they're overloading? Is there any way of, um, has anybody spoken to the fellow that just built the third house, you know, on the left-hand side going, going out of Ledge Road? Or, he, or he, I don't know if he started. He was start, I understand he's he put the, the foundation down, and he's yeah. starting to build the houses. You know, I mean, if we get the information, maybe somebody could speak to him. Maybe we can get a piece of that land in, if in case we decide to uh, turn the trucks. You know, yeah. Or, well, or at least well, open well, it up. Well, we can make it available. We won't have to even speak Preferred to about it if, uh, whatever. So, Mike, when you and I spoke last week, though, I thought we were going um, to, I, I thought we were going to get a list of everything, a written list of everything that we were, had tried to do with the outcomes of why either it potentially could work or wasn't going to work. Well, that's what I just read off. That I, I didn't understand that you wanted a written list. I right. thought you just wanted me to present what we've tried. Because I was trying to take notes as fast as I could. Could we, could we do I that for the 27th? When yeah, I can type it all up and here? send it to you. Because I just want to see each one we've tried, why it didn't work, or if it could work, under what circumstances have to be right to make it work. I mean, we've had a more we've than had happy, in but this it, town for a long time. It's not just there; it's everywhere. Every I think time the, we try to do something, the answer to almost every one of these is without a viable alternative. I virtually every option is, is not going to work. That right. that's the reality of it. Um, I know this isn't a public hearing, but there's a resident in the back raising his hand. Is anybody against him speaking? Are we allowed to let him speak? You're right. the You're right. Uh, the, anybody against him speaking? No. If you want to come up to the microphone, state your name and address. <coughs> Hi, Derek Perry, 45 Ledge Road. Uh, in regards to the, the stone and stuff getting dumped on the street, you can get down there with Newport now on Sunday mornings around 9 o'clock. They're running their sweeper up and down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, I know definitely on Sundays, and they have done it a couple times during the week. So you know, they, they get the big street sweeper, so they are running it yeah. up and down the road getting all the stone up. And it's, you know, it's multiple times during the week. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but they are out there. I mean, I'll give them credit that that much credit. I understand. They are trying to, you know, Keep be clean. somewhat good neighbors. Yeah. Um, but it's more, you know, it's it's not. It shouldn't be happening. It, well, yeah, it shouldn't be happening, and um, you know, it's more about just the kids on the street. That's all it is. The you know, my my wife and our another neighbors had more than one run in with truck drivers who, when they come down the road, yell at my wife because she's parked far enough back now on the side of the road. Right waiting to A, pick up the kids, or drop them off at the bus. And they're all independents, too. They don't, <coughs> they don't belong to either one of those. No. Companies, so. You know, and years ago, we knew all the drivers. Yeah. They'd wave, and we knew everyone. Now there's, you know, 50 trucks before 8 o'clock in the morning. All right. And it's... But, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Mike, thank you. For me, I don't know about you. But, uh, uh oh All right. Um, anything else? So we're going to revisit this on the 27th with Paul yeah. here. That brings us to the meeting minutes. Okay, I'll make a motion that we accept the regular meeting minutes from October 7th, 2019. Bless you. Bless you. I'll second. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have seconded that. I <laughs> dropped the ball. Would you like to? That's fine. No, no. We have a motion to yeah, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I'll make a motion that we accept the regular meeting minutes for November 4th, 2019. Second. Motion to second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And we have. Um, the executive session meeting minutes from December 16th are in three different segments. Um, make a motion that we um, accept but not release um, all three segments of the executive session meeting minutes. Second. I have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Selectman and liaison reports. Virginia. Tonight. <coughs> George. Uh, Paul, uh, just to revisit the, the DPW building on River, on Richardson Road. Yeah. If we could somehow get the gate locked, you know, like we, you know, at whatever time. I had heard a rumor that there was going to be an electric gate or something going up there, and potentially, or you had looked into those. But it's it's open all the time, and I know today there was a couple of New Hampshire cars on the other side of the building, and when somebody went in there, they just took off. I don't know if there was so people are concerned. Okay, fine. I'll check in. I'll check into it. I like it? Thanks. Yeah, because because there there's a long time ago we promised it. Right, but this fire the fire there's somebody on that site every you know during the work day, but yeah. it shouldn't 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 be open at night. That's correct. No. Okay. Yeah, but it. <laughs> We've been both asked to drive by and check it, and the gate is sometimes open. Okay. All right. Um, Pat, you. liaison reports. Do you have another one? Is that it? It is for me, yeah. yeah. Thank okay. you. Uh, it is a couple of quick things. Um, uh, last, uh, last week, um, Bob Doak, who many might know as the fire superintendent of the Chelmsford Water District, passed away. Um, he was a wonderful person, a very kind person, a very knowledgeable person, and he is definitely going to be missed, so condolences to his family. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, um, I've seen a lot of comments about the, the, the new lights at North Road in 495, and I noticed that they were out there today. I guess they're setting them up to, to flash. They are flashing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And they will be um, for the next 30 days. For the next 30 days. I've seen comments that it's going to be less time than that. It is no. 30 days, and that's the protocol for how long? It's the same it traffic was. manual that Michael was speaking to. Right, so it days. will be 30 days that they'll be flashing before they go live. So I just wanted to let everybody know about that, not to expect it next week. That road's going to be cut off? Or is that a few Yeah, that will, that will take place uh, next spring and, and summer, yeah. And, and just yeah, to be Worthen, clear, that's... that's at, Worthen, at Worthen and North Road will be reconfigured to a T intersection. Correct. And then the other end of... Uh, Westford. Westford is already closed. It's already and the signboard are out there. And, right. and, and there's been questions about whether that's permanent or not. And David well, and some other it's, people. But it's, it, yeah, it, it's it voted. Sense. It's permanent. Yeah, and and you know, but it, we haven't put a yeah, we haven't yeah, 
we haven't drilled permanent. I mean, mountain. unless unless something happens to the traffic patterns right. that we look at and say this is definitely not wor right. working. Right. The intent is to leave that permanently closed. Right. That's correct. And the police are out there monitoring it, uh, and, and 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 the assistant DPW director Steve Yonley, he'll be out, out there monitoring it. And then in a month, when the tra other traffic signal is working, then we'll revisit it again. Um, We've gotten feedback on both sides, yeah. you know, in terms so far. But again, I know they're we they're really adjusting the lights at Academy to try to exactly get that timed right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we had to we we had to wait for everybody to get back to work. You know, this week was is going to be the first real right. full week with everybody. Right. But doing what, what people got to bear in mind is the flow when the light turns green by the flagpole it obviously works better because you're not right. having this game of people trying to get in at the same time you're trying to move with the traffic signal. And and I've worked with Chief Spinney. He's ensured that we've had since day one uh, a cruiser in the area because the question and some of the feedback we received initially was you know this is all well and good but if nobody's enforcing the people blocking the intersections at academy this isn't going to work so um, when it started last week he had a cruiser out obviously the traffic was light he had one today and he said he will have one there tomorrow and the subsequent days to ensure that this works the way it should yeah, it is nice to have someone out there involved in the traffic side of this mm -hmm. while it's going on. Okay. Um, I don't have any guys on reports to follow up on. Um, so with that, any press questions? No, no press. Yeah, make a motion to adjourn. Very good. We have a motion second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you.